Welcome to School Day at NTTBF, hosted by the Library Science Program at Sam Houston State University's College of Education. I'm Jill Bellamy. I'm the librarian at McCullough Intermediate School in Highland Park Middle School in Dallas and a member of the NTTBF Steering Committee. I am so honored today to moderate I'll Be There For You panel, and let's welcome our amazing authors. Welcome Ernesto Cisneros, a longtime educator. Ernesto currently teaches reading and writing at an inner city intermediate school in Orange County, California. His debut novel, Efren Divided, won the 2021 Purabelle Prey Medal, and it was named to numerous best book lists and was on our own 2021-22 Texas Blue Bonnet Award Master List. His follow-up, Falling Short, releases March 15th. Welcome, Ernesto Cisneros. Next, let's welcome author Leslie Connor. Leslie is the creator of numerous award-winning books, including the National Book Award finalist and Schneider Family Book Award winner, The Truth as Told to Mason Buttle, and the Schneider Family Book Award winner, Waiting for Normal, which was on our Texas Lone Star reading list. Ms. Connor first studied fine art and came to children's books through an illustrator's point of view but she discovered she had many stories to tell. Her latest, Anybody Here Seen Frenchie, released in February. Welcome, Leslie Connor. Also joining us is New York Times bestselling author, Margaret Peterson Haddix. Margaret started out as a journalist, working as a copy editor and reporter before following her true love, fiction. She is now the author of over 40 books, including several beloved series such as The Greystone Secrets, and the Shadow Children series. Ms. Haddix's books have received multiple awards, including numerous State Reader's Choice Awards, and have been translated into more than 20 languages. The School for Whatnots, her latest standalone, released at the beginning of March. Welcome, Margaret Peterson Haddix. Next, welcome Marco Shiro. Mark is the author of the young adult novels, Anger is a Gift, winner of the 2019 Schneider Family Book Award, and Each of Us a Desert, and the middle grade novel, The Insiders, which was named a 2021 Publisher's Best Book of the Year. Their next middle grade, You Only Live Once, David Bravo, will be released this fall. When they are not writing or reviewing for the Hugo-nominated Mark Does Stuff, they are busy trying to fulfill their lifelong goal to pet every dog in the world. <laughs> Welcome, Marco Shiro. <laughs> Love that goal. And we finish out our star-studded panel with author Sarah Penny Packer. Sarah is the creator of 17 books, including <gasps> the New York Times bestselling series, Clementine, and the National Book Award finalist, Pax, whose story continues in the long-awaited sequel, Pax Journey Home, which released last fall. Sarah's books have won numerous awards, including many State Reader's Choice Awards. In addition to writing, Sarah has a lifelong love for art and enjoys creating and also helping teachers integrate the arts into a childhood literacy education through the Dream Project at California State University. Welcome, Sarah Penny Packer. Welcome Hi. to you all. So great to have you here. Now let's get started with some questions. All right, the focus of our panel obviously is friendship, and all of your latest books focus on kind of a core friendship or friendships. So can each of you tell us a little bit about that relationship that's at the center of your story and the inspiration behind it? And how about, let's start with Sarah, since we've seen that special relationship with Peter and Pax through sure. now two yeah. books. Yeah, yeah, and that is a special subcategory, uh, the subcategory of friendships with animals, which I think is really important and growing more important um, because I think if you looked at the last few decades and the few decades coming ahead, I think one main theme is what some people are calling the humanizing of animals, which I, I don't actually like that term, but you know, I, I think when you look at, at our books and 20, 30 years, kids are going to be shocked that, for instance, we ate animals. So we're just moving that way. But even without that trend that we are, that we as a society are looking at animals more as, as competent, sentient beings deserving of, you know, a lot of the respect that, that we right now only give humans. Um, even without that, I have always been so impressed 
at the way kids have this, what I like to call radical empathy, where when they form relationships, they don't care about class or race or they just don't care about these things. But even to the point where they don't care about species, species is not a boundary to how they're going to perform and make their friendships. I really admire that. The kids in the audience watching right now, you have it right. And I really admire that. So um, anyway, it falls within the two categories, I think, of friendship stories. And one is the story about the friendship, about forming a friendship, which is, that's the plot, right? Um, but friends perform so many other duties in stories that are not about forming friendships. You know, they're there for support or challenge or, you know, a, a listening ear or a way for your, your main character to express him or herself in a way that uh, they wouldn't normally on a page. Anyway, so doing that with an animal was a really interesting thing for me. Um, I decided to try, um, well, how did I first get the idea? I will tell you that I always, especially from the time I was a kid, I always hungered for a wild animal to make a connection with me. I felt that that would mean that was going to be a really high honor is if I, you know, I think I read the yearling and uh, uh, the book about the raccoon, I'm missing its name now, but I always felt that would be a really cool thing. That would mean that animal sees something in me that's worthwhile. So um, Peter's on a journey alone and he would not have, unless I have a relationship with someone ongoing, which is an animal, uh, which is Pax, um, there would be so few ways for him to express what he's going through, um, the emotion of the journey, or um, let me just pull up this new book. Because if you haven't seen the new one, if you haven't seen the cover, oh my gosh, I mean, didn't you think this was the best cover ever? And now there's this one. Um, I, think, I think Pax, be Pax plays the role in this book of mentor in a way. So friends in books can play lots and lots of roles, but mentor in that Pax has a few things right that Peter doesn't yet have right and needs to learn. I think that's what I would say about it. Thank you. Thanks for asking, by the way. Through this pandemic, I've been two years locked in. Nobody wants to hear me talk about books. So. <laughs> Thanks for asking. We're thrilled to hear you talk about those books and thrilled that Pax yeah. is back in the sequel. Okay, great. How about uh, Ernesto? Can you tell us about Isaac and Marco and their special bond? Oh, oh and you're on I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the quote <laughs> of the decade. That, you would think that after a year of teaching on Zoom, I would get it right, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I've been teaching for 26 years, and I've been privy to what, uh, being able to witness to uh, the friendships of so many young people out there, and watching my own kids grow up, and um, and I always look at them, and I always really admire how kind they are, and I look, I, and I I did a little bit of reflecting with myself about you know characters and what I wanted the next book to be, and I think back to 12 year old me, and at the time. I never thought 12 year old me was special at all. I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't a straight A student. And I would watch everybody else and thinking that I was just fell short and that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't at the same level as everybody else. And uh, so I wanted to, to kind of address that a little bit. And my son, uh, I'm always, they're always inspiring my work. So my children really are where all my books come from. And my son used to do this really <laughs> quirky thing. Um, we used to have fish when, when they were little. And at the, at the, at the pet uh, store, they classify the kids by uh, the fish, by community fish, the semi-aggressives, and the aggressives. So on the first day of school, I pick up my son, and he's already has a little notebook, and he's already categorized all the children, whether they're community students, uh, semi-aggressives, wow. or aggressives. And so I'm like, oh, so is this is that your friend? And he's like, no, no, that's one of the semi-aggressives. So I have to be careful with him because he, wow. you know, I'm not sure about him. And so I thought that was just phenomenal. So that's the quirk that I gave uh, Marco here, Oops, Marco here on, on um, as one of my characters. And uh, quite honestly, I feel like so many times books, we focus on the negative aspect and we don't um, cherish the how wonderful children are. If you were to ask me, how do I feel about 12 year old, my, myself as 12 year old, my 12 year old self, I think he was amazing because he had the biggest heart. 
And just because of that, I love 12 year old me, but there's no way I would ever would have seen it. So I wanted to make sure that um, I, I want children to be able to see that in themselves. So this is Marco. He is into comic books, reading, uh, doing wonderful at school, but his dad doesn't connect with him because he was a high school jock. And so he thinks that even though he's the tiniest kid in middle school, that if he makes the basketball team, his dad will like reconnect with him. Isaac, on the other hand, his parents are, are in the middle of a divorce. And he thinks that if he gets his grades up, kind of like Marco, that his parents won't have one less thing to fight about. So they're pretty much going to try and swap. And ultimately, it's a, it's a friendship story. And it's about the gift of self-acceptance. And they love each other unconditionally. And there's no toxic masculinity in there whatsoever. Because I, have, I don't see that a lot of times with my students. And they're amazing. And I just wanted to really spotlight that. But, uh, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ernesto. It is a lovely story of a, a true friendship. Okay. Mm -hmm. Leslie, how about you? Can you tell us about Aurora and Frenchie? Such a special sure. friendship. Sure. This is the cover. Um, I you know, I, I love the, that our panel is titled I'll Be There For You, as I think that that's, that kind of um, summarizes uh, what, what this whole story is about. Um, I have two kids in this book who are incredibly close friends, and it's a friendship that's nuanced by neurodiversity. Aurora and Frenchie are both on different uh parts of the autism spectrum. So when I was when I was researching autism, one of the things that I failed to ever grasp was any kind of a chart that could draw what what that all means. Um, it's a it's, there's a very big range, and it just simply means that they're neurodiverse in some way, or their brains are operating a little bit differently than what is called normal out there. And you know, the neat thing about um, about learning more about autism is we're learning that the range of so-called normal there's not normal. There's just how we are. So um, Aurora, I, I, the thing that I love um, to do, and I think that Mark has heard me say this before, is that I really think it's important to put the character before their disability. That's who we want to look at. We don't want to assign anything to them. So I start to watch my characters kind of play out almost like a little mental movie before I really go and, and sort of diagnose them or find out what it's what everything is called that they might have or be identified with. So Aurora just kind of presents us this very loud, impulsive girl. She's 11, um, bouncy, and has had trouble making friends because she's maybe what you might say is a little too much sometimes and people are kind of taken aback and don't know how to get a word in edgewise with their with her and Frenchie on the other hand kind of comes new to town and around third grade and Aurora, they uh, they befriend each other but the other thing about Frenchie is he doesn't speak at all he is a non-vocal autistic boy and there's a difference I want to mention between non-vocal and non-verbal. He does understand language, so therefore he is verbal, but he doesn't speak. And so and so that he is non-vocal. So um, when they meet, um, Frenchie kind of attaches himself to Aurora. So this is my person. And it works very well for her, you know, silently. This It works very well for her because she's had such trouble making friends before and she wants to do all the talking anyway. And so they um, they become very bonded by that and they move along through school. They are very um, interested in the natural world around their home in a little town in coastal Maine. Um, and one of the things that I got to thinking about was when there are, you have kids on the autism spectrum, you know, they're offered, they're given, they're tried to, they try to teach strategies. And most of that is to sort of help them become more comfortable in social environments. So my thought at 11 years old is what happens when one friend in a friendship is a little better able to start uh, working with those strategies and having those strategies be successful for them, what happens to the friendship? Does, does anyone get left behind? Uh, so Aurora begins to feel the tug of the possibility of friends in sixth grade, you know, a broader, a, a broader scope that way, you know, that, that tug of a, of a social life with others. She meets two new girls and they start to hit it off. Um, and then, uh, but, but, you know, she becomes distracted and uh, they usually, usually the uh, Aurora and Frenchie enter school together and she drops them off at a classroom. This is the first year that they, that they are separated by a classroom. And uh, lo and behold, one day Frenchie doesn't make it to his classroom and nobody really knows where he's gone, or at least we think nobody knows where he's gone. Uh, and that's the other piece of the story, I think, is that, um, 
they, you know, she, she feels horribly guilty, but she also kind of has had a lot of responsibility for him or has felt a lot of responsibility for him. One of her questions has always been, does anybody see him? This kind of what you call a double entendre, that's the, the title has two meanings to it. You know, we're going to literally, French, she's going to get lost in this, in this story. But the other thing is she feels like people haven't observed him, haven't watched him. I think that one of the big sort of one of the things I really wanted to say about friendship is I think that we're at our best when we are reading someone else's behavior and really, you know, that's how we really know how someone feels. And in Frenchie's case, that's that's everything for for Aurora. So um, we'll probably get to other aspects of the book later. I think that's what I would say about their friendship for now. Oh, thank you so much. Such a special <laughs> friendship. And I loved Aurora and how how much she was. <laughs> So great. All right. And Mark, how about you next? Tell us about Hector, Sal, and Juliana. Yes, of course. And, and also, hi, Leslie. I haven't seen you in years. <laughs> it's been literal years. Um, uh, yeah, I, in particular, wanted to do something that I hadn't really seen um, in the books that I read. And I'm sure that there are books that exist that covered this specific dynamic. But I remember being eight years old and moving from Boise, Idaho to Riverside, California, and the sheer trauma and, and, and friction around losing a friend group because of geography. Um, and so The Insiders follows Hector Munoz, who has moved from a very progressive sort of liberal and accepting place in San Francisco, California to the suburbs of Sacramento. Um, and in doing so, he feels very distant from his original friend group, Tim and Sophia. Um, I wrote the book in January and February of 2020, and their entire friendship happens over FaceTime. And this was not intended as like a commentary on how many kids have had to maintain their friendships over devices, but it has sort of become the thing that a lot of kids relate to when they read the book is they're like, oh, I know how hard that is and how hard it is to feel like you're slipping away from your friends because you're physically not in the same space. So Hector is dealing with that while he meets a new group of people who might be friends. And so that is a sort of space I wanted to be in is where is this kid who feels like he's losing his old group of friends, but has, meet, has met people he thinks he could be friends with, but isn't sure. And there's that weird middle ground where you're feel sort of aimless and detached. Um, and it is oftentimes a very lonely and isolating thing to go through. And so that is the sort of space that the book exists in. Um, and so the other half of it is then exploring, like, how do you form a friendship for the first time? How does that actually work when you meet kids your age and you think they're cool and you're like, how do I start talking to you? And, oh, I'm dealing with all this personal stuff, which makes me also think that you might not like me because I'm weird. And so there is that element to it, as well as, you know, he feels like he's had to keep the secret of who he is. At his old school, he was able to be out. He was in theater. He was this exuberant kid. He gets to this new school where he's immediately made fun of. And so he suddenly goes into a shell like a little turtle and he's not sure he can tell anyone who he actually is. Um, and so that, that is where I wanted to write about friendship is what happens when you're in that weird middle space, you're in the transitional period. Um, and how do you make friends when you're not sure if you can be yourself? Um, and really what it comes down to is that that that's how you know you can be friends with someone is you can be yourself with them. You can be your whole weird, true, you know, identity and live in it and find joy in it. And that's what Hector comes to find, um, both with the table of misfits, the group of kids at his school, and then uh, Juliana and Sal, who he meets through this weird magical janitor's closet on his campus. Great. Thank you so much. I know it's very relatable. Like you said, I think we can all relate to that. Wanting to make new friends or being, um, displaced all of that so great thank you so much okay and margaret tell us a little yeah. bit about max and josie in the school yeah. and whatnot well max and josie if i can hold this up and get the lighting right are right up here at the top of the book and that is very the way they are standing is very indicative of their friendship because josie is kind of always leading max into things uh, they meet in the first day of kindergarten, first minutes even, and on that day she introduces him to the joy of jumping in mud puddles, something he has never experienced. So uh, they, they are best friends from that moment forward because they share so many interests. And most of the action of the story takes place at the end of fifth grade when Max finds out from Josie that they may never be allowed to see each other ever again. And of course, that is not something that either one of them want. And 
They both are trying to figure out how to get out of that. Max also does not understand a lot about kind of some background of what Josie is dealing with and what's going on in the school. And I, and I like how Jill is nodding because <laughs> there are a lot of secrets in this book that uh, it, it's really hard to talk about without giving away a lot of things. Eventually, Max finds a note that Josie leaves him that says, no matter what anybody tells you, I'm real. And he's thinking, well, of course she's real. She's my best friend. I've known her since kindergarten. I know who she is. But there's kind of an element in this book of how well do you know your friends? And I think they're, they're both 11. I think a lot of kids at that age are dealing with that. You know, I thought I knew my best friend, but now I'm changing. Now my friend's changing. Uh, you know, there are all those issues going on. And for Max and Josie, they also find out a lot of things that are related to their friendship and their school because of adults and what adults are expecting and what the adult concerns are. And um, some of that grew out of, well, when I was a kid kind of dealing with all of those issues of I'm changing, my friends are changing, my friend group is changing, I need new friends, they don't want it, my new old friends don't want to be friends with me, maybe all of those issues that a lot of people have to deal with. But I was also thinking about when my kids were in middle school, I'll, I'll freely admit, I was kind of an idiot about a lot of things. And I would say to my children, oh, how is so-and-so doing? And I, you know, I, I named someone that they had been friends with forever. And they kind of look at me and, and sometimes they would actually say, mom, I haven't spoken to that person in six months. And, 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 you know, some of those friendships are changing so quickly. Some of the kids are changing so quickly and adults are pretty clueless. And so that was a lot of what I was reflect, reflecting on in this book. Thank you. And it is fascinating with so many fun secrets and twists and turns. So thank you so much for sharing a little bit without spoiling because <laughs> everybody's going to want to read it. All right. So um, moving on a little bit, definitely friendship is a core, but then you have also all tackle very important topics in your books, such as divorce, loss, grief, intense bullying. Um, so how do you address these issues and ensure that you portray them authentically for young readers? All right. And we can start with, <laughs> does anyone want to start? Do you do a little think time as a good teacher would give you? <laughs> yeah. Um. I can just, I just start. Yeah. Okay, okay. Ernesto, how about you? And then we'll go to Sarah. And then I'll call. It's a little, when we're in person, we can kind of jump around so easily on the panel, but the virtual, you know, we're trying not to <laughs> interrupt. It's a little harder to do, but we'll start with Ernesto. Margie, did you want to go? Or? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, we all want to go. I love it. Well, one of the things is that um, I always feel like one of the advantages I have as being a teacher is that I get to kind of witness all this kind of play out. And uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight was that, um, I mean, I've, I've experienced situations where things have been handled correctly and where things have not been handled correctly. And the one thing I wanted to highlight was actually when they're handled correctly. Because I, again, I want to emphasize the, the uh, kind of like emphasize the, the way things should be. So in, in my book, without giving away too much, there is a, a coach there who he, he has the, the best player ever. And this actually has happened to me where I had a former student who ended up playing in the college level and he was already being recruited. And he went to one of the best top high schools as a freshman, made the varsity team and was a starting point guard. And so when, when we see him on campus, we all knew that we were good, that that's a guaranteed championship, for example. Um, and so what I wanted to illustrate was that, unfortunately, his behavior, he was bullying one of the characters uh, in the story. And I put the whole situation on the coach where do we, and this has happened actually in my son's school where he's at right now, where some of the football players got into some trouble because they were, you know, bullying somebody else. And it, it's become a big humongous issue with them. Um, as a coach, I wanted him to actually kind of decide, am I going to do the right thing and kind of help the student to, to navigate how life is at the expense of me losing a title. And that was exactly the situation in the book. Um, and I wanted to, you know, I, I remember going back to when I was coaching and I, I did have a, the superstar student and he wasn't listening to me and I benched him for half the game and we were losing to a school that we shouldn't be losing to. 
And he came back second half and he just, we ended up winning the championship that year, but his parents came up to me and they thanked me. And they're like, Mr. C, you're the first person who has ever benched our son. And they were like, thank you so much for doing that. And so I wanted to just kind of highlight how important it is that we don't tolerate uh, uh, bullying uh, at schools. Um, and that students should be able to tell the teacher because growing up, we were always told, don't, 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 don't be a snitch. And really, you don't owe anything to these people. If they're messing up your school, you don't owe them that. Um, and it, it can be fixed. Um, and I guess that's the message I wanted to show. Thank you. Margaret, did you want to go next? Sure. I, I will follow Ernesto, and I'm really glad to do that because I, I really like his idea of wanting to show a situation where things are done well. And um, I've been thinking recently that we need to see more of that. <laughs> and uh, I think we would all feel a lot better about the world if we see that. In my book, things are not going the way they should be going. And uh, the story that you told where the parents thanked you, I am really glad that they did that. I'm glad that they were that supportive of their son as a whole person instead of just as an athlete, that that is wonderful. In the school for what's not, Max's parents make a very bad decision because they are so concerned that he not be exposed to any situation where he might be bullied or that he would become a bully himself. So they are very, very overprotective. His, the family is very wealthy. And so they end up trying to protect him to the extent that he's a fifth grader and he really does not understand much about the world in general. And that I think is a very dangerous situation for a kid. I mean, Max is a good kid. There's, this is not his fault, but he is way too ignorant about what's going on around him. And that also makes him makes it so that he cannot understand what his best friend Josie is dealing with because he can't, at the beginning, he can't even comprehend a lot of the situations that she personally has to deal with. Thank you, Margaret. And Sarah, did you want to speak? I think you had started to. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I thought I thought you were calling on me next anyway. So um, what, <laughs> yeah, this, sorry is such a, this is a huge topic. And one of the reasons I think it's so huge is that um, I'm pretty sure it was E.B. White, the, the great writer E.B. White said that our job when we were writing specifically for kids is to do just what you're talking about, Ernesto, is to fairly and honestly present the world as it is, but at the same time, it is our job to model it, to model what it should be. And over the last, I won't say four years, but four <laughs> years just before this, when I would go and talk, I would say this, and I wonder if you all agree. I can't remember a time when those two things, the world as it is, and the world as we would model it, were ever so far apart. I don't remember a time when uh, it was just out there openly things that we would say to kids, you don't ever do that. You don't ever act that way or, you know, bully. Anyway, let's not go there. But because there's such a big difference, I think it makes it harder. So you want to present an accurate, a, a real story because kids are really living all these things, but you also want to model how it could be and should be done. Um, that's actually a really big role of friends in a story is that, so something has happened, for instance, in impacts, for instance, well, two, two big things, wars happened and loss of a parent has happened, loss. So you want to show some realistic responses to that. But when you have friends, when the same thing has happened to two friends or two characters, then the author gets to show two different responses. And without judging, and that's often really hard. For instance, I will say that the hardest thing for me in writing Pax, especially Pax Journey Home, was that Peter's response to loss is not a response that we as parents or loving adults would want kids to take, which is to shut off, to become you know, angry and isolated. But I, as the author, have to write about that as though that is a perfectly logical and, and relatable way to respond. That's the right thing for him. 
So it becomes the role of friends in books to model a different way of dealing with it. And if you're lucky, you can have at least three characters in your book dealing with the same issue. So we can just show fairly, here are some different things. Um, I'm always leaning more toward the model than, uh, than how, how tough things can be. I'm, I'm much more drawn to modeling how, look at how it could be. Um, that just might be who I am. But I also agree that kids need that more. They need that. Oh my gosh, since the day those World Trade Center towers fell, we, I've been, at least I have noticed that we are unable to keep things from kids that otherwise we would choose to say, no, no, you're five, I'll tell you about this when you're eight or something. We can't do that anymore. So it's important to continue to model things. Great points. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for waiting. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd messed up the order there on who was going next. Okay, Leslie or Mark, would either one of you want to speak to that? Sure, I'll be I'll be fairly brief. Um, so so much has been said. You know, I feel like as a writer, one of the things I think about a lot is that um, when we are in middle grade, when we are 11, 12, 13, um, it's it's this time in your life when <laughs> either your parents either are in charge <laughs> or imposing rules on you or the adults in your life, I should say, or they're failing to be in charge, and that brings you a different set of problems. You know. Um, and I, when I, when I wrote the truth is told by Mason Buttle, he's being sort of underparented at his home, but I think that the kids are so smart and perceptive, and I think that this, you know, builds in them a sense of empathy, and you know that maybe, and maybe there's someone in their classroom who is under the same situation where, you know he's kind of on his own at home. He has a home to go to, there's food, you know, it, it's not, it's, it's not homelessness exactly, but uh, just where, just where, you know, things aren't quite right at home and, uh, you know, depression can be a huge, huge piece of that. But I do think that um, I think kids see it in the book. They go, they know that this character ne needs more or could use more. The other thing that happens in Mason Buttle is that um, he's bullied relentlessly and there's not enough intervention on the part of the adults. And I think kids know that. And I like to kind of, you know, sugar them and get them thinking about that. And I would just add that sort of like bookends both what Leslie said and and um, and uh, Ernesto uh, or Efren, sorry, is this notion of what kids are supposed to do when you are being bullied and what are you supposed to do in the ideal situation? And in particular, I want to, because there, I mean, I, all of us can speak this in the like intermediate middle grade space, bullying is very frequent because for many of us, that is the formative time in which we were bullied the most. Like, you know, it is unfortunate, but it is a, a reflection of what actually happened to a lot of us. So I wanted to talk about that, but twist it slightly where in The Insiders, Hector is bullied and he actually models the behavior you're supposed to do. And he says, okay, this is happening. I don't like it. So he goes to an adult. An adult. And this is based on what I went through when I was in seventh grade after I was being relentlessly bullied is I went to an adult. And while the circumstances are different in the book, the same thing happens, which is the adult blames them for being bullied. And so I wanted to do a situation where a, a kid reaches out to an adult and isn't believed. Because I think that is an aspect that some of us go through, particularly those of us who are queer or questioning, where the, an element of who we are makes it so that people don't believe us. And so it isn't just that Hector is being bullied, his whole sense of who he is, is being put into question. Um, and so it is a difficult thing. And, and I just did a school visit actually yesterday with kids who couldn't actually believe it had ever happened. And when I told them, oh, this is based on, and I told them the whole story of what happened to me in middle grade, a lot of them struggled with the notion of like, well, that just seems cruel. Why would an adult ever do that? And having kids actually deal with like, what is what happens then? Well, what would you do if someone who was an adult was really cruel to you and did something mean? And then watching these kids discuss with one another, well, oh, I don't know, do you tell another adult? And then I watched that light bulb go off and, and this kid said, well, why would you ever trust another adult again? And then everyone in the class was like, wait, that's what Hector, oh my God. And he just watched this moment of like, all of them suddenly were like, wait, that's why he acts the way he does throughout the book. And just seeing this new understanding come over it. And so 
it was interesting because that's the ideal thing that I wanted to happen as kids read the book is that they have that moment of, wow, maybe now I understand another kid in my class a little bit better than I thought I did because I have a new lens on it. Um, I think also getting to do it in the lens of speculative fiction and having this magic allowed for me to do something that is real, that is you know, admittedly very emotionally heavy, but then there, it still was fun and there's still excitement and adventure because I think you can have both things. It doesn't have to be, if something sad can happen to a character, but the book itself and the story itself doesn't have to be sad as well. Um, and so it was nice getting to sort of balance the two of them so that Hector in the end had agency. He could choose what he wanted to do about how he wanted to solve his problem. Um, but that was sort of the angle that I was going for and why I wanted to pull it off the way I did. Thank you for sharing. I hate that that happened to you and it was so um, so heartbreaking in the book, but I like that, that you're opening eyes to the story. So thank you. Um, I'll do one more. I have tons more questions, but our time has gone by so fast. So, oh my gosh, five minutes. <gasps> All right, let's go. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll do one more and then we'll go to the student, but let's get some student ones in. Okay, so we have a student, Kevin, who asked, and this will be a quick one so everyone can answer real quickly. Um, he would like to know if writing exhausts or energizes you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, both. Oh, both. Yes. <laughs> yes. Both for yes. everybody. Oh, I love yeah, it. Both. As in oh, like, <laughs> as in like, we are both energized and exhausted. Yeah, by it. I think with yeah. any art, any art can be exhausting, yeah. but also just so energizing and beautiful. So yeah. great. Oh, great. I love it. Yeah, okay, then we have, uh, so funny. Okay, we have a student that said, I love this one. Rin wants to know if you ever have moments when you're just, genuinely surprised by your own writing oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the reason to write <laughs> to be and, so and when characters start doing things that yeah. I don't plan for them to do that it's like they're just like take over the entire book yeah. that's when I know the character is real yeah yeah I think yeah, writers would understand it. the whole thing is a, is a revelation <laughs> to, to mm. us as well as to you so I love yeah. it Okay, and then this one I love too. Uh, Paranita would like to know if writing and publishing a book or multiple books um, has changed the way that you see yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Not really. I'm still an 11 year old at heart who lacks confidence, <laughs> but I try to make those things work for me. <laughs> so, you know, stick with, your, with the heart. Of, of an 11 year old so no <laughs> uh, I else? Oh, like that too that's probably why you still write such amazing books you still got that 11 year old heart anyone yeah. else on that one um you know I, I grew up with a sense of disentitlement and I just my family we we cleaned homes we you know we uh we were mechanics we cut grass and so I just saw myself being very limited with my options for in the future I thought that's all that was available to me and uh, with the success of Efren, Efren Divided, I now see that there is a, a need and a call and a desire for people. And people do want to read about uh, Latino families, too, and Latino characters and diverse characters and LGBTQ characters and Asian Americans. And it's, it, it's very, it, it warms my heart to see that. So I think that they've, uh, they've definitely, it has changed my life, uh, my perspective, how I see the world, too. Oh, that's I, I would like to say, because this is an answer I would like to give four kids, um, is that, um, believe it or not, I have now 26, not 17. <gasps> but I'm on number, yeah, no, on number 26. My apologies, we have a, let's we get have a, that corrected. Well, I, I've been busy lately, but um, I, I won't show you, but I'm sitting in my office right now. And if you came in my office, you would see a top shelf. And I have two offices. I do this in both offices. On the top shelf running around the room are all of my books put up there and nobody comes in my office. I'm not showing off. It's not a bragging thing, but it's that I find I come to a point of absolute failure on every book I write where I realize I've started something. I don't have the skill to finish. I don't know. I am going to fail. And the only thing that, that helps me through that is to have every one of those books up there. And I look at every one and I can remember the point at which I said, I've just failed. I couldn't possibly do this thing. So I recommend this to kids, put your stuff, the stuff you did that was really hard that you thought was not gonna happen. You keep that right out there. I 
over 25 books. I need to see that, that I did get that book finished. And I like that book now. Um, <laughs> I need that after 25 books to complete book number 26. So yeah, it really changed. That's where it changes me. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that our time is up and I can't believe oh, it. No. This is so no. wonderful. I could talk. I had, so, I had pages of questions and so did the kids. But uh, you all are amazing and you write the best books and uh, these all of your books fly off of our library shelves. And um, whether you're just starting in your career, or you have 26 books um, <laughs> or over 40 in the multiple yeah. languages. Thank you all so much for what you do and please continue writing. Um, and those of you viewing, I hope you'll watch more of our panels and join us in person tomorrow at the festival if you can. All right, congratulations to all of you. Thank you for what you do and please continue writing um, and making great Same stories back at you. Thank you.